Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781's Debrief Show. Um, this week, we'll be discussing uh, the uh, first committee meeting of the year, and uh, something special about this uh, one and moving forward is that they're all recorded, um, which is just strange that that's noteworthy. Um, and then we have special guest Christy Mackinon to talk about uh, solar panels and solar carports, which was discussed in the Ordinance and Rules Committee. We'll be talking a little bit about uh, the farm um, and the ownership of the farm and where that's headed. And also we'll be talking about um, the Master Plan Committee and their idea of going on tour around Waltham to do a listening tour. Um, but first I'll introduce the team as uh, Josh Castor. Hi there. Emily Sperry. Hello. Special guest, Christine Mackin. Hello again. As always, James Kerkelis. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we've we been going at, at this for almost a year now. Um, and partly one of, our, one of our jobs is to record these meetings. And James has really been taking up most of the uh, helm here um, in this past year. Uh, but today or uh, this week was the first time James went in and the WCAC local access was uh, doing their thing during the committees, which is strange for him to see. Um, and they were recording the meetings. If I was if I was the city of Waltham, I would make a bigger deal out of this because it is a big deal. Uh, maybe, maybe they just don't want to admit that they weren't doing it before. So if you go to the city's website, you can now, there's a whole tab now on city council committees and uh, license and franchise and long-term debt. That was never recorded, never on local access. The only place you could find it was on our websites. And as a personal anecdote, I started recording these meetings in 2018. No one was doing it at the time, although apparently I've heard stories of people doing it in the past, you know, years and years and years ago. And some people took it very seriously as well. That, that hasn't been for years. Um, we've really, in most recent memory, been the only people doing this. Um, in 2018, it was just me. Um, and so even separate from all fam data, I've got, I uh, uploaded it onto a YouTube channel, Waltham City Council Committee meetings. I've got hours and hours and hours of me just holding a camera to people's faces. The first one I had to look just to be sure in February of 2018. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. And now, you know, now we don't have to record them. For our show's purposes, we still have to go on Monday. We can't wait until they come out on Wednesday and Thursday because we record on Tuesdays. But um, but we don't have to do the labor of recording these meetings and uploading them. Now it's always just going to be on the website. So, I mean, that's it's a good day uh, for transparency. It's a good day for me. Uh, I was very emotional on Monday when I first saw it. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, and a win to uh, Joey LaCava as well, who mm -hmm. uh, spearheaded this. And also George Darcy, who has attempted throughout years doing this. And uh, Joey just uh, took uh, the helm and realized that there was the overwhelming public pressure that I talk about all the time, which uh, is the only thing to get things done in the city. And he took that and he pushed over the finish line and that's that. Does anyone else have any personal anecdotes on recording meetings? Yeah, I just want to say this is a big deal for me because uh, you, as you say, you've been recording them for years. I uh, got involved in trying to push for them to record over a year ago. It was the original reason we started the Waltham Data YouTube channel. Um, so this is a big step forward to see them not just talking about it, but actually doing it. And I'm grateful to the counselors who helped make that happen, which was mostly LaCava uh, Darcy and Paz. And, um, but the other side of it is there's no captions. And that's something we've been asking for just as long. In fact, when I wrote to the city council about this last fall, and some other people wrote at the same time I did, we all talked about recording all the meetings as kind of a means to an end to getting them all captioned. And then in the meeting since then, captioning always seemed like an afterthought. They talked a lot about the reasons for recording and then it was kind of like, oh yeah, captioning too. So it's not really surprising that it hasn't happened yet. And maybe it's in the works. Um, What's frustrating is we don't know. It's like there, no one really feels the need to respond as to whether they're doing this or why they're not doing this. Um, they could. There's no technological reason or 
financial reason I know of that they don't provide captions. And my understanding is that they're required by federal law to do it. And maybe they have a different interpretation of the law, but no one from WCAC has ever said that. The closest we've got to his explanation is in one of the committee meetings about this, the director of WCAC was there. And when Councillor LaCava asked her about captioning, she said something like, oh, well, that's just an additional thing we'd have to do. And we think it's already being done meaning she thinks that a lot of people have TV sets that auto captain, which is not an acceptable answer. That's not what they're required. They're required to provide them under the law and to provide them on the online versions. Um, so that's frustrating. This isn't a situation where, you know, sometimes communities fail to make things accessible to people with disabilities because nobody's brought it up. Nobody's thought of it. And that's not what's going on here. This has been expressed to them over and over. And not only have they not done it, but they haven't even explained why they're not doing it. So I want to once again challenge Justin Barrett, who's the head of the board of WCAC, to make some kind of public response about why they don't caption their content. And if he doesn't do that, I really think it needs to be an issue in the mayor election next year, um, because he seems to be a close ally of the mayor, and he seems to have a habit of just completely ignoring um, issues that affect people with disabilities, as I've said before. So I'm really happy about the recording. I'm happy we don't have to organize. We don't have to, well, we don't have to make you and James, <laughs> Chris and James, go in there every week to record, that's awesome. But it is kind of now very conspicuous, the lack of captioning now that it's been asked for for so long and still not done. Beautifully said, uh, Josh. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is not over. Uh, you've mentioned in the past and on our show that while they can record these meetings, there's plenty of meetings that they don't record. And if they call a special meeting uh, on a day that's not Monday or Tuesday, um, then they skip over the captioning, uh, the recording completely. Um, and so there's still a lot, a lot of work to do, uh, but it, it, was a, it was a good day. And also you still need to be in person to make sure that the meetings getting posted or that, one, or that, all, that you're seeing all the meetings that are getting posted too. Yes, absolutely. It's good to see that it's happening at least, some progress. Yes, yeah. I'm happy for you, James. Um, moving along. Uh, Solar carports. Um, so this was brought up in ordinance and rules. Uh, this was already something in the docket, uh, but it was talked about at length. Um, and I, I'm going to hand it off to uh, to James to talk a little bit more about it. So this was a uh, modification to a special permit for uh, a, the uh, Hampton uh, Inn and Second Ave in over by the. Um, uh, uh, the Home Depot on the west side of Waltham. And uh, the modification was just for allowing them to, I guess, put the extra electrical equipment and set it up for like uh, the, all the electrical hookups for the solar panels that they wanted to put on over their parking lot. And it was uh, it was interesting because you could see the uh, counselors look, looked very excited to talk about this. Uh, I think it was Harris in particular seemed to know it was coming and and uh, McLaughlin also was particularly excited it seemed. The gist of it was that they were going to be putting uh, housing structures over the cars with solar panels on top of them and they're sloped in a way that like they're not going to collect a ton of snow and that it'll melt off in normal heating and they mentioned that it would supply 75 percent of the power for the uh, Hampton, and it would also um, have some degree of battery backup for supplying power to the grid too. That was all super entertaining to watch them uh, be excited about this, and it seems like a good idea for me at the time. But we we aren't that knowledgeable about where the municipal municipality is um, with solar panels in general and uh, what we could be doing. Um, and so uh, we asked our friend Christy Mackin to talk a little bit more about that. Hi, thanks for having me back on. Um, so I did a little bit of research into solar panels in general and solar panels in Massachusetts and solar panels in Waltham. Um, and just to zoom way out, um, 
If anybody is interested in seeing what some solar panel arrays look like, like the one that's going to get built, the REI in Framingham has a solar carport on top of it. I think the one that's um, down by Fenway might have a solar carport now. Those things exist in various places in Massachusetts. Um, Brandeis currently has a really extensive solar array on the roof of their gym facility. So it's not on top of a carport, it's on a roof, but you can see it pretty easily if you go walking down by the tennis courts behind Brandeis. Um, and solar carports, in my opinion, are a really great thing to do because they're relatively easy to build compared to some other kinds of solar panels. You don't have to have your building designed to support the weight of the solar panels. Um, you can just kind of throw them in after the fact, regardless of what shape the building is in. They are not gonna get in the way of any kind of roofing projects. They don't need to be considered for roof draining, although they do have to be considered for draining and clearance, especially in the winter when you're designing the carport. So solar carports are a little bit easier to build and a nice, project. They also prevent heating up of parking areas. Um, if you've ever walked through a long distance in a parking lot on a hot summer day, you know how hot it is. And it's much nicer to have that shade available as long as we're still doing surface parking. Um, the problem in Waltham is we have terrible zoning around solar panels. Um, if you go looking for solar energy or photovoltaic, which is the technical word for the technology that's in the solar panels, those appear basically once in our zoning code, which is in the definitions, um, where they're defined as renewable alternative energy, which is totally reasonable. But then if you go looking for renewable alternative energy, the only place those words appear is in a definition of uses that are permitted in certain zones. Um, and honestly, even having done four years on the city council, I found this part really confusing. Reading through it, it's not clear if they, you are permitted to put solar panels wherever you want on your property, um, if you're just generating electricity. Because the way the zoning is written, it makes it seem like it's more for research of photovoltaics or for like industrial electricity generation, which is not the case here. Um, they are not selling energy back to the grid. They're not establishing a solar farm for multiple properties. They're just going to put that solar energy right back into their own facility. Um, so since the counselors were so excited about this project, um, which came in as a modification of an existing special permit, it's not a special permit specifically for the solar panels. Um, they might not even have had to talk about it if it weren't for the existing special permit conditions. Um, but it would be nice to see the city of Waltham update our zoning to make solar panels explicitly allowed in any condition where you're building new parking. Um, it might even be worthwhile to create incentives to add solar panels to existing parking. Um, one last piece of information about Waltham's zoning is that a lot of cities if it's not prohibited, it is permitted. So if the city of someplace Massachusetts does not say you cannot have backyard chickens, it means you can have backyard chickens. Well then it's the opposite. If something is not explicitly permitted, it is prohibited. There is no zoning in the city of Waltham that says yes or no on backyard chickens. Therefore you can't have backyard chickens unless they're a pet, which is an end run around it. Um, but we run into the same problem with these solar panels. If it's not explicitly permitted, can I build one? I don't know. Um, which makes it hard for developers and individuals to figure out what they need to do to do these kinds of solar panels. Um, and with climate change inevitably bearing down upon us all, we need to do everything we can to decarbonize power generation um, I applaud the municipal energy aggregation program as a great first step, but we need to be making it easier to do renewable energy in the city of Waltham and solar panels are a great way to encourage that. Um, in the committee, they talked about um, solar carports being nice, but they were concerned about if they were ugly or if they were too big, um, 
is that something that other cities are concerned about when talking about these kinds of things? I thought that was a weird talking point. I have heard that before. Um, to prep for this conversation, I actually talked to a number of people who either study or work in the like energy industry. Um, and one of them actually specifically does project management for municipal solar arrays. And he said, it's way easier to get those up and running in places that are kind of rural where they have some kind of out of the way place to tuck the solar panels because people think they're unattractive. They're this like, they stand up. When you look up at eye level, you're gonna notice the solar parking. Um, to me, honestly, a parking lot's already ugly. You're not gonna make it worse by putting a solar panel on top of it. Um, that is my opinion. If somebody is more concerned about aesthetics than they are about function, um, then I think they have bad priorities and I'll leave it there. Can we, can we pull up a visual aid? Can you show me what a solar carport looks like? Um, so I just put in to Google image search solar carport. Um, this is kind of what they look like at an angle from above. They are fairly large structures that hover over the top of parking. Um, it's not any uglier than a multi-story parking garage. It's um, hideous. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, doesn't, doesn't Walden have that? They did mention that they would have like snow okay. catchers and that they were at like a pretty relatively like a 30 degree angle for the snow. Okay. So maybe a little more like this one with a big swoop on it. Yeah, um, and like a snow catcher at the, on, the, on the side. And you're right. Walden does have them, which is also neat. And it looks like that just provides shade. I wanted to see if the, yeah, the oh, framing yeah. Yep. looks like this. Yeah, I have seen those in Framingham. Yup, I knew I'd seen them somewhere. So when you go walking into the parking lot after you're done buying your outdoor gear, um, it looks like that. It looks like a shade canopy, frankly. You can't even tell that it's solar from underneath. I think they are more attractive than staring into the sun on a hot summer day. Um, I don't know if there are a lot of design features you can use to make them look more attractive. They're meant to be functional. Uh, maybe there's a way to make them pretty, but maybe there's not. And we probably should have talked about this at the beginning of this conversation. What exactly is in front of the city council right now? Is it a special permit to put one solar carport in one special permit, or is it uh, changing the zoning to allow solar carports in general? A minor modification to the special permit for this location to allow them to do that explicitly, I believe, was the. Okay, so we're not even talking about changing the zoning to allow this everywhere. This is about one place, one time. I am talking about changing the zoning to allow these everywhere, but yes. the city council is not. Yeah, we're not yes. even we're not even there yet. We're not even talking about that. Oh, the well, city council just, is very excited, so that's why it's noteworthy, for sure. I just want to add on to that. I think the city has to rewrite its zoning, not around um, solar panels on on properties, but around um, solar power plants because there was that case in front of the Supreme Judicial Court that Waltham lost um, where the way the city had interpreted our own ordinances to say that solar um, power plants were allowed but only in industrial zones which are less than two percent of the city and the court ruled that that wasn't reasonable. So the next time someone comes and asks to put a solar power plant, we have to give them a different answer because that answer is not legal. So mm -hmm. it seems like, I don't know if that's something that can be resolved within City Hall, but it seems like at some point the City Council needs to pass some kind of change to the ordinance to say where solar uh, power plants are allowed. That's really, I'm glad you brought that up because I was reading the zoning and I was like, is this only allowed in industrial zones? Surely not. That is absurd. Um, and that lawsuit was over accessing Lexington in a residential area to facilitate like a thing in Lexington. Oh, neat. Good for them. Yeah, yeah that's right. We did, uh, Waltham would not allow a road through a residential area in Waltham to get to a solar power plant in Lexington because that wasn't an industrial area and went to court over it. This is a good transition into... Um... Master Plan Committee. So I think I'm just going to jump ahead to that. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Um, speaking of zoning, this is a good transition uh, into that. Um, the master plan committee uh, recently announced that they are going on tour around Waltham to do a listening uh, tour of citizen input hearings in every ward in the city. Um, now we've talked about the master plan committee before, but we really haven't talked about it that much because this is the first notable thing that they've done. They have not met once in person. Apparently they've been talking via email, which brings up concerns about open meeting law uh, violations. Um, but uh, they came up on uh, the city council uh, this week to say that they are going into each ward. They're doing eight meetings. They're combining ward eight, nine, and five, and six. Um, and then they're doing, it's essentially just like ward meetings in so many words because they're looking for input to create a master plan. Now, master plans. There have been many in Waltham. Um, I think in, in a general sense, there have been at least two in recent memory. Uh, these are non-binding uh, resolutions, essentially, just saying words about what they plan to do. Like these aren't, you know, set in stone. This is not what they plan to do. And and so in for a lot of cities and a lot of instances, master plans are a waste of time and resources. I think that this is going to be very important. These particular meetings in Waltham are going to be very important because there is so little accountability in some of these wards. Some of these wards haven't seen a ward meeting in years. And now we are all going to have a chance to go to these. Um, anyone can go to these. Anyone can speak and, and say your piece. Say what you think about Waltham. Say what you think about your ward and what you think uh, should be happening in the wards. And I want to say, although it is non-binding, what, what happens in those meetings will be listened to. They will have a say in how the master plan gets formed. And so I would really like uh, people to go to this. I um, transcribed the, uh, the schedule. I'm going to share my screen and also say it out loud. Um, but the first one is this coming Tuesday, wards eight and nine are at 510 Moody Street um, at 6 p.m. Um, so if you are, uh, if you live on the south side, I would encourage you to go to the recreation department, 510 Moody, um, and say your piece about how you feel about the south side right now and what would you like to see happen to the south side uh moving past that on october 6th is ward five and six combined at government center at 919 school street at 8 p.m uh october 19th is ward three at northeast elementary at 7 30. Uh, october 20th is ward four at 7 30 at fitzgerald october 25th is wards two meetings uh at 6 p.m in macarthur uh two days later on october 27th is ward one at 6 p.m at kennedy and then in november is on the 10th uh, is ward seven's meeting uh my ward uh 6 p.m at 119 school street and then sometime later on uh, november 29th is going to be one big city-wide meeting to talk about the city as a whole no, I think these are all important. I think if you live in these wards, you should come, you should uh, listen. And if you feel compelled, you should speak. These are very important meetings and I think you should come to them. And we're gonna be there. If they're not recorded, we're gonna record them. We'll be giving um, you know, our take on each of these meetings. Uh, we're gonna try and make this a big deal, even if the city of Waltham uh, chooses not to. Although city of Waltham did share the first meeting on their um, Facebook page. So maybe they will. I'm excited about it. Anybody have any thoughts? I'll be there recording on Tuesday. Oh, hi, Tisha. Yeah, I am really looking forward to these meetings. I think that zoning is one of the big priorities, if not the top priority. Um, feel free to counter that. And I hope that's something that um, we can really dig into and focus on. And uh, as for like things to bring up too, like stuff like, um, Moody Street being closed, event, events on there seem like a pretty natural thing to get, be getting brought up in this, I have to imagine. I just wanted to say, I just hope the fact that they're, I mean, it's awesome that they're doing this. I just hope the fact that they're organized by ward doesn't make people think that you're only allowed to bring up issues that are specific to your neighborhood. Like you can also bring up issues that have to do with the whole town or that affect people other than you that you still care about. It doesn't have to be about things that are happening right in front of your house. And it sounds like they're gonna be very open in terms of what you can talk about. I hope that's the case. There are some, 
times or certain certain people I think in our city government who try to really constrain what can be discussed in meetings sometimes so I hope people think about their real priorities and go in there and say them even if uh even if not 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 be meant meant to feel that their thing is off topic or something like yeah. that yeah, I think these are technically citizen input sessions, uh, which means that there is no back and forth between resident and counselor. Um, it's just they're gathering data, so they can't actually technically, according to the rules, they can't even respond. Um, so and it's just about the master plan of Waltham and that and that encompasses everything. So literally whatever topic you want to talk about is allowed to be talked about at these meetings. Um, if I if I was going to be a stickler, if I wanted to be a stickler, I would say that they might be able to say if it's not about the word specific, then they could probably shut you down. But you can turn anything into anything. And you can turn any topic into a word topic. So whatever you want to talk about, this is a good, good time to do it. And one of the only times to do it. There are so few instances of giving public input in a municipal way, except for special permits. There's no public input in uh, Waltham City Council meetings, um, like other cities do. There's very few ward meetings, except for some wards, um, and we can talk about that later. Um, but this is very rare chance to just talk about whatever you want in Waltham and have the audience of the mayor and the city council. And lastly, um, just uh, quickly, uh, the farm was brought up at this last meeting, um, which came out of nowhere for me. Um, the care, custody, and control of the Waltham Field Station was transferred to the Consolidated Public Works Department, which is in charge of snow removal and and a lot of like power outages and trash and things like that. And so the farm ended up with them. And uh, if not for George Darcy, this would be a very easy vote. But um, George decided to bring up the issue of, is that where it really should be going? Um, perhaps the conservation committee would be better. Perhaps forming an agriculture commission uh, would be better. Um, he had almost no support at all and no one else voted with him. Um, but it was a contentious uh, meeting and I'm glad he did because it brings up the question of, is that right? You know, everyone talked about wanting to, you know, not slow down the process, but this has been going on for years and it's, all, it's already pretty much set in stone. What's the harm of discussing, is this, is this the correct place to put it? And so th that happened. Um, are there any thoughts on this from our uh, esteemed colleagues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think at first I was sort of um, go. I hear the words agricultural commission, and I'm and I'm all in. Um, and not having a law background, um, it's difficult for me to have too much to counter what the mayor brought in in terms of um, what she was talking about with the thirty b process and every single uh, step and the steps that need to happen. Um, you know, she she made a big a big show of. Um, pointing out several times that the current nonprofits at 240 Beaver Street are current tenants in sufferance, which basically means squatters, they don't have a lease, um, in not so many words. And that was upsetting. But um, if I'm to have some good faith, I, I do think that everyone does want. Um, those existing nonprofits to have it, at least be able to apply to have a lease. Um, and I think that no one is arguing that Consolidated Public Works run the farm. For example, when, when I was working at Waltham Gales Community Farm, UMass was still doing some of the tasks like mowing the lawns, you know, they so they weren't doing the farming and stuff, but they were mowing the lawns, uh, taking care of some emergencies like the boiler room came up in Committee of the Whole. So that's been an ongoing issue there that UMass at the time had to deal with. So um, Consolidated Public Works might deal with issues like those. And that does make a lot of sense to me. Um, and, you know, when it's time to uh, do the RFPs, it, it does make sense to me, although it's it's not it's not fun, you know, that um, the existing farm nonprofit, Wealthy and Fields Community Farm, 
um, you know, would put together their RFP and, you know, hopefully I, I don't see a reason why they should be um, approved. They've been the stewards of that land for uh, decades and take, took care of it when it had, you know, no one else was. Um, but that all said, it, it actually does seem like a reasonable process to me. I mean, you look, you know, I've mentioned, you know, just in conversations with other people before, you look at Natick Farm, you look at Landsake and Weston, and, um, you know, they're both nonprofits that rent land from the municipality and the setups may be a bit different. Um, but once you try and step back, at, um, you know, you see that the structures are not so different. There's struggles. Um, there's been struggles for decades and decades between all these nonprofits and the municipalities. But in the end, everyone in the community really is doing their best to um, take care of their farms and have the farms take care of the people in the community. The way the mayor is proposing to do it may not sound like the most fun, let's do it now way, but this it may actually be a perfectly reasonable way to go forward. And also, I do think we should have an agricultural commission um, that could, you know, do have some oversight in addition to all of this. Emily, can I ask you, you sort of explained this, but I just, just to back it up a little for people like me who haven't been following this this closely, am I understanding correctly? So the, the city owns the land, the farm is a nonprofit which is using the land, Correct. but they don't have a lease. And there are other nonprofits using the land that don't, can you explain just a little more about how that came about? Yeah, so in the past, um, these organizations have had leases, is my understanding with UMass, who previously owned the land. Um, and, you know, at, at some point, you know, the, it was a, the UMass field station, there was a lot of research done there um, by UMass, and there's a whole long history, but without short of getting into the whole history, you know, it basically, my understanding is, uh, it sort of fell out of use. And there was a group of um, people who basically saw a fallow field and started using it and that ended up becoming Waltham Fields Community Farm um, is the hyper condensed version of the story. Um, and, you know, they then, uh, I don't know what structure, if any, of a lease they had with UMass, but they had some sort of agreement with UMass and UMass did some custodial work on the land, including mowing, maintenance, some some minimal maintenance. So they, they yeah, they had some the nonprofits had some agreement with UMass. So what are the other nonprofits there now besides the farm? Go to this waltham.fieldstation.org site. There's there's a whole history tab, but then there's also um, oh, tenants. So these are tenants who are they don't have a lease at this point because UMass is no longer the owner and they don't yet have a lease with the city of Waltham who now owns it. So they're, they're all, I, I would presume, eligible to you know, put in an RFP to have a lease. Um, but it's, you know, they, they, none of them owned the land before. So you've got um, the Waltham Land Trust, Waltham Business Community Farm, this Boston Area Climate Experiment, um, which does just what they say they do, um, Mass Farmers Markets, which they oversee a number of farmers markets in the area, um, Grony in Massachusetts, which they, they do education um, and some sales of native plants, and then Green Rose of Waltham Community Garden, it's, it's um, set up community gardens. So do you think these groups are likely to get leases if they apply for them? Or do you think the mayor is setting the stage to, to, to kick some of them out of there? I genuinely do not know. And that's why I use the words in good faith. This is the way they're going to go about it with this RFP process that does actually make sense to me. And then they can have legal protections as tenants. Um, for example, when the boiler room broke and there was some sort of leak. Uh, 
and it needed to be fixed, there was some sort of issue where UMass didn't come out. It would provide a little bit more protection if there was actual leases with the landlords. That said, of course, it does feel like it provides some vulnerability if they're not grandfathered in somehow. But um, my answer is I, I don't know. But I think the only way to find out is to take that next step. Thanks. Thank you. And I think that's all for our debrief. Um, I'm looking forward to next week. I thought this week was good. I'm hoping to hear uh, new resolutions uh, coming from the city council, hoping uh, to affect the lives of working class welcomites. Um, until then, we will be here doing this next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.